to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 626, and my name is Camden Busey. As usual, I'm back here in the studio in Grays Lake, Illinois, uh, where uh, we're going to be bringing to you a bunch of clips from 2019. Uh, you know, as has been our practice since Christ the Center began nearly 12 years ago, we've taken time to look back at the end of the year uh, upon many of the highlights and, and uh, some of the big points of our previous year on the program. So we're going to be doing that today, looking at the top 10 highlight clips from Christ the Center. But before we do that, I did want to at least uh, pause and take a moment just to reflect upon our year, not only at Christ the Center, this particular program, but also at our organization more broadly considered at Reformed Forum. Some of you may have seen uh, a recent video that I posted uh, with an appeal uh, asking uh, for support, and uh, that video, I think, encapsulates a lot of what we're after in terms of promoting and and trying to accomplish our mission of supporting the church in her charge uh, to present every person mature in Christ. Uh, We're really committed to that, um, to what Paul describes in Colossians 1.28 and, and in the immediate context and see ourselves as merely a tool or an instrument to be used to support the body of Christ in the accomplishment of, uh, of her great commission labors, her, her labors, and many of us here at Reformed Forum, indeed all of us on the faculty, uh, are ordained ministers in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church seeking to engage uh, directly in the work of the Great Commission in our personal callings and ministries as we've been called by uh, our presbyteries to engage in that in a variety uh, of capacities. And so Reformed Forum is merely a, a help, uh, an additional organization that, that helps to, to produce theological resources and distribute them, also create opportunities for theological education, and to support, generally speaking, the work of the church in presenting every person mature in Christ. This year was a really, really uh, big year, a significant year for us. We were founded, at least this program began in January 2008, and uh, we've been at it for a long time. Uh, But just this year, I began uh, serving Reformed Forum as our full-time executive director. Uh, We also were able to produce and uh, to release our first full-length kind of Sunday school curriculum, a video series by Lane Tipton, Teaching Foundations of Covenant Theology. That was uh, made available in October, and uh, it's available on the website right now. And then uh, most recently, we were able to bring Lane on board in a more full-time capacity where he uh, has been appointed as our fellow of biblical and systematic theologies. We're delighted to have him with us and to have him focused and concentrating on on some really important projects. You know, looking ahead to uh, next year, we've got a lot on our plate um, we're trying to develop two additional courses. Uh, they won't necessarily be exactly the same in format as Lane's Foundations of Covenant Theology, but I'm developing an introduction to covenant theology that will be more targeted towards a, an online YouTube slash Facebook audience with lessons that are anywhere from five to ten minutes. So I've begun production on those. We also uh, hope to record some more traditional lecture-style courses, you know, with 30 to 30-minute 30 to hour-long lectures if necessary. Um, and we're hoping to and, and planning to publish three additional books in, uh, along the lines of what we've been able to do with No Uncertain Sound and with uh, Gerhardus Voss, the, the biography by Danny Olinger. So we hope to publish some more this year in 2020. Uh, I've also got a lot of trips lined up. Uh, don't need to go through them all, but if you want to watch that other video, certainly you can find out where we're headed and what uh, we're planning to do. But there's a lot of exciting things, even going around the world, all the way to Italy to uh, Colombia and uh, to India to do some work even with uh, foreign missions and to assist uh, the work of the church in in teaching pastors and uh, church officers, wherever they may be, uh, to unfold and and to unpack and share the great message of Christ crucified as it's revealed in all of Scripture. So all that's to say is if you'd like to read more or find out more, you can subscribe to our email list where we release uh, stories like this and and uh, try to share with you the wonderful uh, work that we're doing here at Reformed Forum by your support. Uh, you can also r- watch the video on YouTube or Facebook where I, I disclose or discuss some of these things. And you can find out all of this information at reformedforum.org. We've got a little donate page there if you're able to help out. We really uh, 
uh, appreciate it. We really encourage you to support our work insofar as you're able. You can head on over to reformedforum.org slash donate. And every little bit helps and uh, helps us engage in this work and to assist that church, the church, the body of Christ, in presenting every person mature in Christ. So I've got a list here, wonderful list. I feel like uh, David Letterman a little bit. Top 10 list, top 10 here. What are we doing? Well, it's the top 10 highlights from this year. Now, it's a little different. In the past, I've kind of looked through all the episodes of Christ the Center and figured out, you know, what I thought maybe were the best ones. And then I spent, you know, a long time each uh, at the end of every year trying to figure out um, what clips I should pull from those representative episodes. This year, it was a little faster for me doing it, at least at the end of the year. It took took a lot longer all told, because each and every week I've been pulling highlights from our episodes, clips uh, from the longer episodes of Christ the Center, and been putting them out almost every day. Every day but the Lord's Day, we got something going out, some new piece of material content going out onto Facebook or YouTube or the website. And so I went to YouTube and I looked at all of our clips that we published from Christ the Center in 2019. And then I looked at them in terms of how many views they received, and I pulled the top 10. So this is a more objective, uh, analytic version of the top 10 list. So it's more hard and fast. I might not have picked these 10 if I was just picking them randomly, uh, or at least according to what I thought might have been the most popular or the most effective. And I wouldn't have put them in this order. But I, we're going to start and not do the Letterman 10, 9, 8 counting down. We're actually going to start from the top, working through all of the clips. And uh, if you've looked at the episode description, you've already seen what they are. So there's no real big surprise. But our first clip comes from Christ the Center, episode 614, where Bracey Hill, Dr. Bracey Hill, who's a senior lecturer in history at Baylor, speaks about Nimrod the Mighty Hunter. We talked to him in an episode titled Christian Perspectives on Sport Hunting, with one of my favorites, and kind of uh, get beyond myself, out ahead of my skis, talking about hunting with Bracey Hill from a Christian perspective. Uh, and so that bleeds through in a lot of these clips, but it was just because I had so much fun and talking about this subject, I kind of got ahead of myself. But we speak about Nimrod uh, the Mighty Hunter. I want to veer in now and speak more specifically about Nimrod in Genesis 10. Uh, you know, there's an enormous amount of historical information to consider. Who would have thought uh, a figure like Nimrod, where um, if if it hadn't if the name hadn't become an insult, I <laughs> I doubt that even that many modern people would even remember who Nimrod was at all. But, you know, introduce uh, Nimrod to us a little bit. Maybe you can help walk us through some of the historical reception and, and I should say, historical perceptions of right. Nimrod, uh, uh, even so, in English history. Yeah, so Nimrod, for, for most of us, is a pejorative. Uh, right. I think in today's, uh, today's parlance, it basically implies a, a rube, someone who is rural, <laughs> right. uneducated, uh, has no real guidance in life. Uh, they're an idiot mm. or something approaching it. Um, and so we don't really use the term that often. Ever so often I do encounter it in popular culture, uh, but it almost begs now an explanation, unfortunately. But mm. in the past, even into the early 20th century, Nimrod was commonplace, but its meaning changes. So the first time we meet Nimrod is in Genesis chapter 10, and that transition between the flood story and then the Abrahamic epic that right. follow. And there's just a brief bit, if you don't mind, I'll read no, it. No, please. I'd love to. And if uh, people have the book, you can uh, check out uh, page uh, 68, because chapter 4 here is is where Bracey gets into real uh, the real meat. And again, there's tremendous overlap with people who are interested in uh, English history, particularly people in my confessional tradition. So this, this is fascinating. Oh, go ahead. As a British historian, I couldn't help but roll that direction. So <laughs> <laughs> You got it. So anyway, it begins, uh, the descendants of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So this is Genesis 10, mm -hmm. six and following. And it goes to the descendants then, and finally it gets to verse 8. And it says, Cush became the father of Nimrod. He was the first on earth to become a mighty hunter. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, before Yahweh. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, which seems repetitive. I'll get back to that. And it says, 
The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. And from that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, uh, Rehob, Bethir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city, and it goes on. Right. So this question is, who's this guy, Nimrod? Because that's basically it. But he's so important that apparently the writer says, hey, look, there's a proverbial way of saying this. This yeah. guy, you want to... There's Nimrod, and if you ever heard about Nimrod, you know Nimrod's a mighty hunter before Yahweh, right? Which is intriguing. So you get this character who's uh, about whom there's very little in the Hebrew story, but yet who becomes pivotal in Christian interpretations, Christian theology for literally millennia to come. So what we get here from Nimrod is, in just looking at the Hebraic scriptures is a character who's a, a transition character. Uh, he provides us with what seems to be a kind of transition between uh, maybe hunting and gathering and then the building of cities, not just any cities, but the great cities of empire, and then he disappears. But he's so well known enough that there's a proverb about him. He's a great hunter. You know, he's Nimrod. Mm. Um, again, uh, the analogy is it's like Daniel Boone. Yeah. And, we don't know Daniel Boone. We may forget who Daniel Boone was. Ask most people, hey, when did Daniel Boone live? They're like, eh, I don't remember. <laughs> but I know he was important. Something right. about the Appalachian Mountains, and he killed a lot of things, maybe a bear. Right. And had a lot stolen from him many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you get this character. Right. and yeah. But what's intriguing is that the uh, Jewish rabbis and commentators come back to Nimrod. And it my argument is because he's such a malleable character, he becomes useful to Jewish thinkers and then to Christian thinkers as they manipulate him. Mm -hmm. The irony is he's a hunter. And how they understand him as a hunter then demonstrates what I would argue is very much their worldview and their agenda. Sure. And well, so he is either demonized. Yes. He is lionized, lionized, depending upon the period. In episode number 600, we spoke with our good friend Glenn Clary about praying in tongues. When I came out of the Pentecostal church, one of the hardest things for me to leave behind was praying in other tongues. Really, that was one of the hardest things to leave because... Um, this is actually not perceptible human language. Correct. The way you correct. Did yes. It. Right. And we didn't even talk about that. Right. But uh, I think and am convinced that, that one can make an argument from Scripture that the gift of tongues, glossolalia, languages, which is what that means, uh, in the New Testament, always refers to actual human languages that would have been understood by somebody who was a speaker of that language. Exactly. Right. Yes. Um, and. That I think you can argue from Acts chapter 2 and from 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 through 14. And I did make an argument for that in the sermon series I did on 1 Corinthians. But um, one of the hardest things to leave behind was praying in other tongues in that kind of way, which I don't believe now was authentic glossolalia. I don't believe it was a true gift of the Spirit, but just my mind. My It was from me. It wasn't from the Spirit. It was from me. Um, but uh, when I stopped praying in tongues and tried to pray in my own known language, which forced me to actually use my mind to come up with words to say, I would run out of things to say very quickly. I didn't know how to pray, and um, I would be at a loss for words to say, and I was very aware of my own inadequacy in prayer, my um, inability to pray for lengthy periods of time, which you can pray for tongues forever. You know, you never run out of things to say because it's always spirit, gift, you know, given on the spot. Um, but one of the things that really helped me uh, work through that was to listen to a sermon that uh, Dr. Richard Gaffin gave on Romans eight twenty six, and uh, where Paul talks about the spirit helping our infirmities. Uh, the Spirit himself helps our, helps us in our infirmities, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. 
And uh, that's a fantastic text, which of course was a text I would have used as a as a charismatic to say, "This is why I should pray in tongues." I don't know that's how to pray. The, the spirit are. gives me, yeah, this, yeah, yeah the they are right tongues. That's, yeah, those that's are the groans. Exactly right. But see, the problem with that interpretation, one of the problems, there are more than one, more than one problem. But one of the problems is Paul says that the spirit um, that the spirit intercedes on behalf of the saints all the saints with groanings that are too deep for words. It's not for the select few who have the gift of tongues, it's for all Christians. So this, you know, the Spirit's intercession is not confined to a few, it's for all the saints. Um, but that uh, text uh, really helped me, and Gaffin's sermon on that text really encouraged me uh, to be to persevere in prayer, because of course we are inadequate in prayer. Uh, this you know, it's our weakness. It's part of our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. Not on occasion. We never know what to pray for as we ought. Um, but the Spirit always intercedes for us, and He does for all believers. In episode number 580, we were speaking with Jim Cassidy about his recent trip to Columbia down in South America, where he lectured on apologetics. And of course, he was speaking about Van Til and uh, the Van Tilian tradition. Uh, but as we were talking about that, I got speaking a bit about liberation theology. So that got a lot of hits on YouTube because it's a video and its title was Liberation Theology. So here's me talking about Gustavo Gutierrez and liberation theology. In preparation for going down to Columbia, I'm trying to develop a couple more lectures for the Reformed or the Reformed Theology and Roman Catholicism class. And uh, I want to expand on the theology of liberation. And so I've been reading a book uh, by Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, the, the foundational book, A Theology of Liberation here. Um, it, it was written in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the 11th printing that I have is 1984. It was originally published in, uh, in Lima in 1971. And uh, Gutierrez is often seen as kind of like the founder of liberation theology. Uh, what happened is Vatican II occurred in uh, 1962 to 1965, I believe. And then after Vatican II, with all the new documents, declarations, constitutions, the Catholic Church charged all the local churches or local regions to uh, take and apply Vatican II theology to their particular context. So Karl Rahner wrote a book about maybe some of the German... Um, the German entailments of this, he wrote a book called The Shape of the Church to Come, which is a fascinating book, and it really discloses his kind of idea of church authority and and kind of a modernist revelation. Uh, but for the Central Latin America context, uh, there was a conference held in Medellin, which is a city in Colombia, very well known because a, cart the, uh, a cartel started there, the Medellin cartel. Um Pablo Escobar's cartel was in Medellin. So that's how I always remember after watching Narcos. But uh, you see uh, that um, this conference was held, and then they sought to apply Vatican II theology for their context. And in large measure, they were trying to deal with the issue of the complete disparity between the prosperous and those in power and the average person uh, in the pews and the average person in the, in the country. And so they rejected, uh, eventually Gutierrez developed a theology that began to reject the status quo and this idea of development by, you know, economic development and whatnot, because it was perpetually keeping the poor and underprivileged in, you know, a condition of oppression and whatnot. And so he kind of wedded Vatican II theology uh, to a Marxist philosophy and developed what's called liberation theology. And that has since been used in, in a variety of different contexts, um, you know, whether that be in certain uh, subgenres of African-American theology and whatnot, have developed uh, a theology of liberation as liberation from racial injustice and whatnot. And so there's some helpful things to read in terms of Gutierrez to help to understand how, understand the Bible and the, and the, nat the relationship between um, God's justice and what they see as political and social injustice. So one thing that he develops uh, in the book I thought was really fascinating, especially for someone who's read a lot of Karl Rahner, is the idea of love of God and love of neighbor and how those two are connected. So for Rahner, love of God and love of neighbor are effectively the same thing. 
And so to love God, you must love your neighbor. And he thinks of the two great commandments. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But he doesn't want to think of those as two disconnected things or things done in two different arenas. Um, because loving neighbor is a form of loving God because he's commanded us to do that. There's a whole host of reasons that Rahner understands this. There are a lot of existentialist reasons and kind of Heideggerian ontology behind his reason for understanding this. But at least in a formal level, we could say that love of God and love of neighbor are not discrete, separate, you know, disjuncted activities. Um, so we can agree at a formal level that that's all right. But what's interesting is that Gutierrez takes this and says not only is love of neighbor, love of God, and love of God, love of neighbor, that is, to love God, we must love our neighbor, but he seems to suggest and, and demonstrate that love of neighbor, and therefore also love of God, must be mediated through particular socio-cultural and socio-political institutions. And so to love your neighbor is not necessarily a matter of... Um, personal private conscience, that you lo must love your neighbor in, in a way that accords with, with God's prompting in your life and according to your conscience, but <laughs> you have to love your neighbor in a particularly Marxist way, you know? <laughs> to love your neighbor means very specific things in terms of political decisions as well. And so that, to me, seemed to be the very nugget of the whole book and the whole movement, is this mediation of love of neighbor through particular ideas of and particular understandings of socio-political and socio-cultural forms and institutions. So I'll leave it at that and, and say it's definitely a, a, a classic of 20th century Christian theology. I won't say that it's a, a book that I could stand with and agree with at, at many points, but definitely a book well worth reading and um, worth wrestling with, and a book that'll, that'll raise a lot of questions. And um, I find the, the value of a book is if I find myself challenged and, and constantly wanting to have a, to talk back to the book, you know what I mean? You guys ever read a book and you're, you're, you're saying, yeah, but what about this? What about, and writing in the margins? To me, that's a book I want to read. It, it, you know, not just a book that's telling me everything I already know or everything I already agree with, but a book that's going to challenge me. And uh, Gustavo Gutierrez's uh, Theology of Liberation is definitely one of those. In episode number 603, we spoke with Dr. Cornelis Venema, who uh, teaches dogmatics and is the president of Mid-America Reform Seminary. We spoke with him about Karl Barth and the doctrine of election. Well, as you know, in his book, or the volume... Part one, I think it is. I forget. Church dogmatics. Church yeah. dogmatics. When KD he, for the for yeah the, the church dogmatics. He tells the reader that now that he's come after having dealt broadly with the doctrine of God and his attributes and the Trinity in earlier volumes, he comes to the subject of election and he he tells you right up front that at this point, though I have great appreciation for Calvin and I have little or no appreciation for the Arminian position that he explicitly repudiates, uh, I, have to, I have to offer a revision. And it's a revision, as I argue in my chapter, that is born out of a judgment that in its traditional formulation, whether in Augustine or then subsequently at the time of the Reformation, especially in Calvin and in Reform theology, the idea of election and reprobation, however you precisely define and describe reprobation, how you relate those two aspects of God's decree, he um, he's of the persuasion that this undermines among other things, the confidence that we may have that God is to use a favored expression of his for us in Christ, so that he wants to, as is consistent with his theology generally, mm -hmm. know nothing of who God is, the God triune, apart from what he wills to be in the eternal word who becomes flesh in the fullness of time and order to fulfill what God in his self-determination, his will to be this God and none other, 
and to make himself known as such as the God who is for us in Jesus Christ. So you don't have a doctrine of God's purpose of election from before the foundation of the world in Christ to elect some particular persons, a definite number of persons, who together constitute the whole of the new humanity in Christ. I throw that in there because I'm appreciative of Bob Inc.'s worry about if you so accent specific definite number, he affirms, you tend to lose sight of the fact that this is the organism, to use a Bavinkian expression, yeah, very much so. of the whole of that new humanity that God is pleased to save and ultimately to glorify, perfect in Christ um, in fulfillment of his purpose. But you have a doctrine of a double decree where some persons, definite number, particular persons known to God, are chosen unto everlasting life. Other persons are passed by or left from whom God withholds justly. They're undeserving. They have no claim upon his favor, treats them in his justice, uh, condemning them for their sins according to his purpose and will, not to, in mercy, elect them unto salvation. Uh, and Bart's worry, and you know, I can't get into all the details, but he rather radically revises the notion of election reprobation to be the election of Christ to be both representative man as the elect one and all of humanity right. in him elect, and to take upon himself in Christ that reprobation and condemnation under his judgment that all of humanity deserves, so that reprobation, in a manner of speaking, has been assumed into God. He assumes and bears that for all human beings, so that if you have a Christologically based knowledge of humanity or the doctrine of man, as a human being, my identity is determined by who I am by virtue of God's self-determination to be the God who elects me and is for me and is gracious toward me and only gracious, which uh, as you well know from the language of Bart, grace triumphs always. God's yes is not paralleled by his no. It's always predominant, superseding, and ultimately obliterating. So that's what leads, I'm going a little too quickly here, but it's what leads Bart to uh, right. the whole question of universalism. Right, exactly. Because he has a doctrine of universal atonement. He has a doctrine of universal election. All are, we are by virtue of God's determination to identify us in the person of his own son and in his will to elect him as elect man, that's my identity. So the gospel is proclaimed in the form of this is who you are. It's good news and only good news. It's yes and ultimately only yes. It's grace toward any and all without exception, which if you were to think, and I argue this in, in the chapter on Bart, if you were to think that through consequentially, it doesn't seem to me possible to do what Bart surprisingly does, and that is refuses to actually affirm universalism. He doesn't deny it. He, he determines quite explicitly neither to affirm nor to deny. Well, that's very well and good, but the theological underpinnings for a necessarily consequent universalist conclusion are all there. Yeah, I uh, Which is why you have a big debate among Bart scholars. Was he a sure. universalism, universalist, or wasn't he? And I argue, actually, in my book, some things that I don't think too many people have argued, although I cite some other sources, that one of the mysteries of Bart's doctrine of election is that everything that he aims to achieve, he, in a manner of speaking, loses at the end when he's pressed on this, this question of universalism. Because if God is willing to grant the possibility of the impossible, namely a person who refuses to accept the good word that God speaks toward him in Christ, such a person is not saved, uh, you, you're back in an almost semi, uh, almost Arminian view of God's yeah. purpose, his self-determination, his ultimate good 
gracious will in Christ Mm -hmm. is ineffectual. Glenn Clary makes his second appearance from the very same episode, episode 600, wherein he was speaking on praying with tongues. Also, he spoke about and answered the question, what is cessationism? Uh, But cessationism is the idea that some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, have ceased. They are no longer in operation in the church today. Uh, Some of the spiritual gifts that you see in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and in other books in the New Testament uh, did not continue after the age of the apostles. And so they have ceased and are no longer in operation in the church today. And so we should not expect to see certain spiritual gifts that you read about in the Bible, such as speaking in other tongues or, or prophecy, um, dreams and visions. Prophecy that are, understood a certain yeah, way, you know. Prophecy understood, not Capital not P. understood as pre- yeah <laughs> preaching, which you know some have would say that prophecy could include or, preaching or foretelling yeah. in a general way. For example, right. we might speak God's word and apply it to a situation. Some people might even call that prophesying in a way, like right. the prophets yeah. spoke to injustice, for example. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes, certainly. Forthtelling, not foretelling. but Yes, foretelling, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, but prophecy is a mode of special revelation, mm-hmm. and uh, speaking in other tongues is a mode of special revelation. Dreams and visions as modes of special revelation. <laughs> and so those revelatory gifts, um, a cessationist, uh, will generally put them in the category of gifts that ha- gifts that have <coughs> ceased, along with certain other gifts like the gift of apostle and prophet. Those um, offices that were unique to a particular uh, age in the church, and also uh, certain signs and wonders and uh, and miracles that you know extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, ceased along with the revelatory gifts that ceased uh, with, the, with the end of special revelation. But we're kind of getting ahead uh, sure. here. Uh, you know, to make the argument for cessationism, is, it's, it's a, not an easy argument to make because you have to uh, look at what Scripture as a whole says about uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and how that fits in with what God is doing in redemptive history overall. And so um, probably the easiest place to begin with making an argument from the Scriptures for cessationism is with Pentecost, the Pentecost event. And, of course, Christ um, being raised from the dead by the Father, uh, ascended into heaven, and was enthroned at the right hand of the Father. And as Peter said on the day of Pentecost in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, that he received from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on the church. And uh, it was on the day of Pentecost. They were gathered together in one place, and there uh, came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, and cloven tongues like fire appeared to them, rested upon each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that was one of the gifts of the Spirit manifested on the day when the Spirit was given to the church. And uh, Peter, when he stood up to give an explanation to the crowd as to what was ha- what happened, uh, cites Joel chapter 2. Um, there's a prophecy yeah. in Joel 2, 28. Yeah, very important about passage. what God would do in the last days. It will come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Um, old men will dream dreams, young men will have visions, sons and daughters will prophesy. Those are various modes of special revelation that accompany this particular activity of the Holy Spirit uh, when the Spirit is poured out on all flesh, dreams, visions, prophecy, and then, of course, tongues. Verse 4 of chapter 2 mentions tongues. So how do we understand um, the day of Pentecost? One of the things I think that was very helpful for me in coming to understand the cessationist position is that the gift of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost is a once-and-for-all event in redemptive history. It is uh, a unique, unrepeatable, definitive bestowal of the Holy Spirit by the ascended, glorified Christ, and that event can never be repeated in history. So in the particular form of Pentecostalism I grew up in, 
and there are all kinds of traditions within Pentecostalism. But the particular tradition I grew up in taught that uh, a person as an individual would receive his own Pentecost experience, uh, either at salvation or subsequent to salvation. Uh, but it's a very different way of looking at um, the gift of the Spirit and the reception of the Spirit. You either have it in the category of the Historia Salutis, the history of sal salvation, or as in that Pentecostal tradition, you have it as an Ordo Salutis gift. So it would fall somewhere among the other benefits of salvation, like justification or sanctification. And the tradition I uh, came to be a part of, the Pentecostal holiness tradition, at least at that time, I'm not sure where they are on this now, taught that there were three distinct works of grace, justification, sanctification, and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow. So it was the third on the list. You could, hmm. you could, A person could receive all of them at the same time, right. but very often you would receive justification first, subsequently sanctification, and then subsequently to that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In episode number 598, Christopher Watkins spoke about the problem of the one and many. Yeah, you also speak of and mention um, in the book also that perennial problem of the one and many and how the, how the Trinity also addresses that. Um, I've had people in the past say, well, this is a, this is a problem that Cornelius Van Til kind of makes out to be bigger than it actually is. You know, it's just a way to import the Trinity into a philosophical discussion and make it seem like it's a bigger answer than what it is. But I mean, how would you see the Trinity really at the root of, uh, you know, the, the problems with which the philosophy wrestles, especially Western philosophy? Absolutely. And you're right to say it is the problem with which philosophy wrestles. I think almost everything that that is of significance in Western thought can be related to, at least, or uh, drawn back to the um, the problem of the one and the many, which is basically this. It's, it's, a, it's a quarrel that started between two ancient Greek philosophers called Heraclitus mm -hmm. um, and Parmenides. Mm -hmm. um, and for Heraclitus, uh, the most fundamental reality of the universe is that it's, it's many, it's chaotic, it's fractured, it's disordered. Um, and for, for Parmenides, it's completely the opposite. If, if you dig down deep enough, what you get to is, is unity and oneness. And so um, the, the, the many comes after the one for Parmenides. And it, it might sound like a, a really quite abstract philosophical um, argument, but it has massive implications for the way that we think about uh, the world and about life is should we ultimately expect to find coherence, for example? Yes. Uh, or is, is the world and therefore our ourselves fundamentally chaotic and we, we shouldn't try to force it into a coherent mold. So, so questions like that come out of this. And I think what the, the Trinity does and the, the way that I try to describe it in thinking through creation is it, and this is a bit of a clumsy word, but, but I think it, it, it's helpful, it diagonalizes that opposition. Uh, and what I, what I mean is that if you start with a choice between the one and the many, you're never going to get to the Bible. Um, because the, the view of reality in the Bible is, is simply more complex than that, and it can't be reduced to a choice between the one and the many. But what, what this idea of diagonalization does is it takes a dichotomy, like the dichotomy between the one and the many, uh, and it, it refuses the terms in which it's originally given. It says God is neither simply one, nor is he simply many. I, I, can't, I can't talk about God in the terms that you give me. I've got to challenge your categories in order to do justice to reality as I see it. And then what, what diagonalization does is it doesn't sort of take a little bit of one position, a little bit of the other. So God is partly one and partly many, uh, but it, it presents a reality that is richer and more complex than either of the positions will allow. So God is Trinity is not saying God is fundamentally one and he's a little bit many or God is fundamentally many and he's a little bit one, or even that he's half one and half many. Um, it, it shows both the one and the many to be reductions, almost to be heresies of the Trinity, taking part of a complex Trinitarian reality and presenting it as the whole. Our seventh clip today comes from episode number 603 once again. So another uh, two-time appearance on the top 10 list with Cornelis Venema speaking about Augustine and Pelagius. You can see why that one would get a lot of clicks on YouTube. <laughs> 
Well, one of the things Augustine does, this is a partial answer to your question, is in his polemics against Pelagius, he uses the terminology Catholic. In the, those days, we're not talking Roman Catholic, we're talking the Holy Catholic in the sense of universal Christian church. He's very anxious to show how what I'm teaching and saying over against what Pelagius is teaching belongs to the teaching of scripture firstly but as well the tradition of the church and he's anxious to show and illustrate that from any number of the sermons and writings of his predecessors among the church fathers and I, I think that's uh, particularly significant it goes to a point I made sometime back in the introductory uh, discussion that one thing I hope readers of the book will take away is the Catholicity of this teaching. The church condemned at Ephesus Pelagianism as a heresy. At the Senate of Orange, I mentioned that briefly in my book, uh, there's a movement, there's a semi-Pelagian party that arises in the church and then eventually comes to have predominance in the later Middle Ages, mm. prior to the time of the Reformation. But the Reformation was, in one respect, broadly speaking, a rediscovery of the biblical Pauline Augustinian heritage yeah. of the Catholic Christian right. Church, so that all of the reformers are appealing to Augustine mm -hmm. um, again and again. I may have lost your question in part of my No, answer. not at all. I mean, but the, it's, the polemical context seems to have given rise to his particular formulation. Yes, and yes. And so it's that's... forged in the midst of that controversy. And so it, it's a, just a, a hypothetical, or uh, it's counterfactual, but you wonder if, if the doctrine would have been formed in such a way had he not had that polemical context. And, and well, you let's, see how, the, yeah, how that, that is. To, yeah. That's a hypothetical. It yeah. is a counter, counterfactual. <laughs> but this question illustrates something I often try to impress upon my students. The, you know, Harnack is famous for his dictum as a classic liberal theologian, you know, dogma in its conception and development is the fruit of the Greek spirit on the soil of the gospel. Well, there's a venom dictum, and it goes like this. Dogma in its conception and development is the fruit of the church's reflection upon Scripture in confrontation with heresy or error. Right. In other words, in God's providence, that topic, this topic so central in Scripture and in the church's confession, comes to the foreground and it's compelled, Augustine has to take a pen and write in response. And, and he, Augustinianism prevails in the church, right. really prevailed in among the best theologians of the church's tradition right up until the time of the Reformation and then was completely dominant among the leading reformers. Mm -hmm. So that this is a historical, somewhat punchy observation. Arminianism was regarded certainly by that company of delegates who attended the Senate of Dort, which is the closest thing you come to a truly ecumenical reform church senate in history since the time of the Reformation. The language creeps up, the, the specter or the face of, Armini, of Pelagianism is rearing its ugly head. Or the, in other words, there was a long tradition, I think it's pretty much faded in the Roman Catholic Church at, at the present time, but the angelic doctor even, just to throw in another name, uh, Thomas Aquinas, was an Augustinian <laughs> on the subject of election. Yeah. Uh, so we're not talking about you know the, this historical polemic that goes, this is some oddity, idiosyncratic emphasis of reformed Christians. Mm -hmm. I think it's an, it profoundly illustrates a loss of historical awareness. Um, the real innovators and those who were going back to what the early church already confronted and at an ecumenical council had rejected, Pelagianism, which at the end of the day, whether in its full-blown Pelagian or semi-Pelagian form, says that when a person decides to believe and do what is required through the gospel call, they're in a little room all by themselves. God is on the outside looking in. Mm 
even if he may be looking in from a distance, yeah. uh, in a manner of speaking, in from his eternity. foreknowledge. Who knows? Yeah. In his eternal mm-hmm. foreknowledge. Mm-hmm. And he's boxed out. And there's a, there's, a, there's a small room where the ultimate decision of whether one is saved or not saved is being made, mm-hmm. and God has nothing to do with it. Let's be perf- mm-hmm. perfectly frank with, about that. Mm-hmm. What determines whether anyone is saved or not saved is what sinners in that little room where they have the power mimicking God's aseity of self-existence mm-hmm. to act from themselves. I mean, Arminius and the Arminians said at the time of the Arminian controversy that God only concurs in that free decision to believe or not to believe mm-hmm. in its effect, not in its moving cause which makes God less than properly omnipotent, Mm -hmm. limits his providence. Mm -hmm. There are acts that occur on the part of a creature. I forget the name of the author whom I cite in my book on the Arminian controversy. Uh, Wrote an essay in Jets. I should have reread the book before our interview today. But he, he says that in effect the Arminian view grants to the sinner in respect to this particular decision, whether to believe or not to believe, uh, godlike attributes oh, sure. of self-existence, of radical independence, mm-hmm. nothing and no one, no circumstance, no pre-existing arrangement of things accounts for the decision that is made or that one should persist in making that decision, which is equally important. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're all on your own. And you're, it's not surprising that it's in, in his popular representation that position has God on the outside looking in mm-hmm. as a spectator waiting for you to make the all-important decision that lies outside of his power to grant it or to prevent it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, I've gone off into some polemicizing as it relates to <laughs> a later chapter in the book, but uh, since... Po- Arminianism is a form, a new form, a moderated expression of Pelagianism. The issues that Augustine was addressing Same issues. continue to recur. Series of footnotes. Series of footnotes, exactly. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. That's an important point. That's good. The history of theology, certainly on this topic, is a series of footnotes. My book is a footnote. To Augustine to, and Pelagius. I have to say, I, was, I mentioned it earlier, rereading Augustine was a great pleasure Mm -hmm. uh, to read those anti-Pelagian treatises. In episode number 578, I think that was all the way back in January uh, 2018, uh, Carl Truman spoke about Luther and Zwingli at Marburg. What were some of the issues coming in that might have presented you know, differences uh, starting out? So what are some of the theological reasons that gave rise to the need for a Marburg colloquy was it more than just the Lord's Supper, or was that even at the very beginning kind of the the, the real sticking point? Uh, if you look at Luther, if you compare Lutheran theology or Luther's theology to Zwingli's theology, there, there are definitely differences in emphases. Uh, justification by grace through faith, for example, which is absolutely central to Luther and will become you know, central to Calvin as well, is is somewhat conspicuous by its absence from, from Zwingli. My, my doctoral supervisor, Peter Stevens, did, you know, did his work on Butzer and Zwingli. And I remember in, in one of my discussion, seminar discussions with him when I was starting my PhD and him highlighting the, the comparative lack of discussions of justification in Zwingli that, yeah. that surprised me. Now, of course, the lack of emphasis doesn't necessarily... Uh, mean fundamental disagreement in, in right. context. Though it has to be said, when you look at Zwingli's allusions to, to justification, he's perhaps more kind of Augustinian slash transformative than, than Luther would have been. But it's, that's not a major bone of contention between them as, as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if Zwingli, if we're looking for a, 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 an emphasis in Zwingli then that we don't find in Luther, I think Zwingli's emphasis on providence uh, is is a powerful one and arising in in some ways out of very distinct uh, 
pastoral situation where 1519 to 1520, the, the plague comes to Zurich and 25% of the inhabitants of Zurich are wiped out by plague. And this drives Zwingli to reflect upon the sovereignty of God and upon the nature of God's providence in a way that was never quite the case for Luther. So with Zwingli, we have, you know, Luther, we have justification. With Zwingli, we perhaps have sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, those weren't major points of tension between them. The, the big one is the Lord's Supper, and very specifically, whether the, the whole Christ, uh, divine and human, is present, to use the terminology of later Lutheranism, in, with, and under the elements of, of bread and wine. Yeah. In medieval theology, as, as you guys know, the 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 thinking was that at the moment of consecration, the substance of the bread and wine changed into the substance of the body and blood of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that there was anemic flesh in the bread and, and just blood in the wipes. The right. whole Christ became the substance of, of both elements. So all that was left was an appearance of bread and wine, not any real bread the and wine. The accident, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Luther, pretty early on in his career, gets rid of that idea and has Christ present, the whole Christ, uh, divine and human, present in the bread and the wine. And that will become the big bone of contention with, with the Zwinglians. Mm -hmm. um, the way that becomes so is, is a somewhat convoluted story, but, but really goes to the heart of, of why Marburg becomes such a big deal and, and divides uh, Lutheran reform. In fact, uh, Jeff very kindly did a plug for the book I did with my yeah. my good pal Bob Kolb. Uh, and when the book came out, uh, around about the time the book came out, I remember having uh, uh, dinner with Bob. I think we were down at Baylor University together, uh, speaking at a conference, and we were having dinner or lunch together. And he made the comment that he expected to be to be beaten up in some conservative <laughs> Lutheran quarters, really? metaphorically speaking, for even writing a book like that with oh a reformed person. And, and yeah, I'm sitting there. Well, thinking, certainly in the, Evan, in the, uh, the Wisconsin evangelical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were... And on the, the conservative wing of the, uh, the Missouri Senate. Uh, whereas as a reformed guy, I, I it never crossed my mind that any reformed person would, they might say to me, this is a pointless exercise perhaps, but I didn't think that anyone would see it as a, an exercise involving a fundamental compromise of the gospel. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's really a crypto decade. Lutheran. Yeah. And there's a long way between the Luther of, of, of 1519, 1520 and the Luther of 1529 that explains exactly why the stakes get so, so high so high in 1529. Episode number 619 was a fun one where uh, I got to speak with Alan Strange and Brian DeYoung up at Grace OPC in Sheboygan. We were there for a conference where Alan was speaking. Brian's the pastor there. We got talking about the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and the United Reformed Churches in North America, so the OPC and the URC. You know, here's, here's a, a difference between the OPC and the URC. And, and I think it's it's a function of age to some extent. Mm. In the OPC, there are still some people around, very few, but some, that were there in 1936 mm -hmm. who still remember those struggles and those fights, and it galvanized them. The URC, that struggle is much more recent. Mm -hmm. And when I go to a URC church... I get immediate access because I've got a Dutch last name. And that creates an instantaneous bond, and we begin playing Dutch bingo to find out who knows who. But there's also a sense that I remember from my childhood and my teenage years the struggle going on between the conservatives and the CRC. I remember the issues. I remember the debates partially because my father was deeply involved in a lot of those things. And when you've been through a struggle with another group of people, you're bonded to each other hmm. in a way that causes you to love and appreciate each other, even though you may have some disagreements. Now, as the OPC gets further and further away from our founding, that bond is somehow changing, I hmm. think. And, you know, new people come in, 
who who knew not Joseph. Mm -hmm. And there's still fellowship, but there's a different quality to the bond that connects us because we haven't been through the struggle. Right. We haven't faced, you know, the theological enemies that were trying to uh, rule us out of order. And it's kind of going to be a new experience for the OPC mm -hmm. as the last of those surviving original members are gone. And all we've got left is the memory of that. Mm -hmm. Having the memory is good, but having the experience is different. Now, everyone ought to know uh, Dr. Strange is is a, a tremendous historian, written several books. I mean, we've talked about the book on the act of obedience of Christ, but his dissertation is also on the table because it's a subject of discussion at this conference, the doctrine of the spirituality of the church and the ecclesiology of Charles Hodge. But um, to get back to your point, Brian, I, w I would like people, I would like for you to speak about your denominational involvement and, and Presbyterial involvement. Yeah. You're archivist of the Presbytery. You're on the committee of the, for the historian. But the OPC does a tremendous uh, amount of work and is very good at cultivating its its heritage and its traditions and its history in writings, in lectures, and in, in various forms. But as as we have more and more members who knew not Machen personally, and we become older uh, as a denomination and further removed from some of those originating struggles, you're right. How do we come to know these things? And a lot of it is a is a bond that's developed through a shared narrative, yeah, and yeah. stories. And and it'd be useful, I think, for our listeners to hear about some of the work you've been doing and the denomination does to cultivate some of those shared stories to keep us, you know, on point and, and to remember the past. Oh, well, can I tell a story? Please. Okay. Well, that seems fitting for <laughs> that's the story. Right, that's right. <laughs> so I, I was somewhat new to the Presbytery of the Midwest, and I noticed that we did not have an archivist. So every meeting on our papers, the archivist spot was blank. And I started thinking about that. I thought, I, I would kind of like to do that. So I stood up at one point, and, and I think Alan was, was actually reporting for a committee, and I said, wouldn't it behoove us to have an archivist? And Alan turned around and pointed at me and said, you got the job. <laughs> and I have been serving as the Presbytery historian and archivist for the Presbytery of the Midwest uh, for a good number of years now. I love it. I love the story of our presbytery, partially because it goes back to the 1930s and the founding uh, of our presbytery. Uh, Arthur Perkins, who was our first moderator, is a fascinating man who served the Lord and who died basically of exhaustion. Uh, in the chair? Or no? no, not in okay. the chair. <laughs> oh, what a way to go. But I want to die <laughs> preaching. My <laughs> wife's like, don't talk like that. I want to preach a sermon and finish, say amen, and fall over <laughs> yeah, dead. <that's> yeah. right. <laughs> but he died I, right I before... somebody out of order. You know? he, he died right before Machen did. And so his his funeral was, oh, wow. I believe, before the Machen. weekend before Machen died. No. Yeah. The end of 36. Yeah, yeah. The end of It was like the 29th of mm. December. Mm. But you, you hear his story... And he was canvassing the state of Wisconsin with the gospel mm. and was so zealous and got so much pushback from the PCUSA. <laughs> and, you know, you start to dig into the stories of the history of this presbytery. It, it's just a gold mine mm -hmm. of information. So then I was at a general assembly, and there was an opening on the committee for the historian, and I was nominated and uh, elected and I've been serving on that. I think this is my third term now. And again, it's it's a bigger uh, venue, so to speak. It's looking at the whole denomination, not just the Presbytery of the Midwest. But we take seriously our history yeah. and documenting it. So one of the things that I've been quite involved in recently is doing oral history interviews. In fact, at General Assembly, we did six of these. And then when I was on vacation this summer in Maine, I got together with Steve and Ann McDonald and did an oral history with them. And then I met with Steve's brother, Paul, who had served on the Christian Ed Committee for decades. And just hearing these elderly saints telling the story of the early years 
and how the Lord used their churches and their pastors and the presbytery, it just fills you with a sense of appreciation for those people who have gone before us, who have suffered, really, for the sake of the gospel, and who really were devoted to Christ in a way that kind of puts a lot of us to shame, yeah. I think. And uh, now to round out our top 10, so sneaking right into uh, the top 10 clips of 2019 was Will Wood as he is speaking on schools of biblical criticism. Yeah, in terms of uh, just that, you know, maybe 150,000 foot uh, view, uh, the kind of main critical schools to be aware of for Old Testament scholarship, especially in the material that we were talking about with the authorship of Isaiah, uh, are fourfold. It's um, a method called source criticism, another one called form criticism, another uh, tradition historical criticism, uh, and then especially today for uh, redaction criticism. And uh, all of these approaches uh, in one way or another have a particular focus on asking the question, uh, not what does the text mean? How are we interpreting the text? But rather, how did the text come into being? Uh, so all of these approaches in one way or another are focused on what we could say are pretextual concerns. Uh, how did the text of the books of the Bible come into existence uh, in the form that we have them today? And is it the way that the Bible presents them as coming into existence? Or is it a, a different means entirely? Uh, so what these uh, scholars do is they pose the question, how do we get the text? Uh, how did we get this uh, text that we are looking at uh, today? With this uh, final form is what they will often call the text that we're uh, looking at. Uh, and then they pose uh, different questions uh, to it. Well, thanks so much for watching or for listening. We really encourage uh, you to get in touch with us because we really appreciate it. And when we hear from people like you, uh, it helps us understand, you know, how we're helping and also how we could help and, and be of better service uh, to the church. So I appreciate uh, following along and that you made it this far in the episode to get all the way to the end of our top 10 list for 2019. But I got one more thing to ask of you. And if you head on over to the website, reformedforum.org, you can get a hold of us there. You can either submit something through the contact form. You can send us an email at mail at reformedforum.org or even tweet us at Reformed Forum or get a hold of us on our Facebook page. There's a bunch of ways to get in touch with us. I encourage that because it, it really is exciting because we start to see the reach uh, that, that we have, uh, and not to make us feel important, but we realize that what we care about in terms of redemptive historical theological resources, in terms of confessional materials that are seeking uh, to get people beyond just kind of a surface level understanding of Christian Christianity, a, a mere Christianity, if you will, but to go deeper in their understanding, to know the depths of the scriptures as they have been unfolded unto us. There are people around the world that are hungry for this type of thing. And we regularly hear from them, people who want these kinds of resources. And so if you're one of those people, let us know. Encourage us, help us, let us know what we can do to support you, what kinds of resources you would like, what kind of books, courses, episodes, what questions you have. Uh, we might not be able to answer every single question or email that you send, but by letting us know who you are and how we can be of service, you really keep us focused on supporting the church in her charge to present every person mature in Christ. Thanks so much.